Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another Friday afternoon uh, webinar jointly organized by Neil and Nora. And it's a pleasure to have these joint webinars. Together, we reach out to the whole Norwegian community, at least the academic uh, community, but also the industry community, startup community, and so on. So we cover most of Norway. And also internationally, we typically at these webinars have a lot of international uh, participants, both from Asia, Europe, South America, not to mention, uh, and so on. So it's a, a pleasure to welcome you all today as well. Uh, this is uh, not the last webinar. We have one more, more webinar uh, coming up and next Friday, uh, June 18th, is a Nora Startup and Nail webinar, uh, which means it will be uh, focusing on, on startup. And, and next week, it will be Student Startup Collaborations, Accelerating Innovation Within AI. And this is, of course, uh, an excellent way to collaborate uh, within artificial intelligence, students and startups together. Uh, with that, I will leave it to Trim to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Klaas. Uh, the speaker today is uh, Christian Balog. Christian is a professor at the University of Stavanger, leading the Information Access and Artificial Intelligence Research Group. He is an adjunct professor in AI and NLP at NTNU, and he is also a former staff visiting faculty researcher at Google. His general research interests lie in the use and development of information retrieval, NLP and machine learning techniques for intelligent information access tasks. He has an impressive age index of 40. He has published over 175 papers, including an open access book on entity-oriented search. He serves as senior program committee member at several conferences. He is a former associate editor of ACM Transactions on Information Systems and the coordinator of several information retrieval benchmarking efforts. He serves as the general co-chair of ECIR 22 to be held in Stavanger, Norway. And he is also the recipient of the 2018 Karen Spark Jones Award and a member of the Norwegian Academy, Academy of Technological Sciences. So, Christian, with that uh, uh, impressive CV, uh, I'm looking forward to hear from you today. The title of his talk today is Towards More Natural Interactions with Conversational Recommender Systems. So, Christian, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I just want to check if you can uh, hear me. We can hear yes. you and we can okay. see your slide. And you can see my slides. Yes, so greetings from uh, Stavanger. The weather is actually better than what my background uh, picture suggests. Uh, and, uh, and some of you uh, might uh, have heard me speak at uh, one of these is serious about a related topic. And uh, I try to change the contents of this talk so that uh, there is some overlap with the, the previous presentation, but, but not that much. And uh, before I start, I want to just acknowledge uh, my co-workers uh, who include colleagues at uh, Google, as well as my former PhD student, uh, Shuo Chang. So I want to talk about recommender systems in this presentation. And uh, let's start by just uh, giving you some general setting. And I think you are all familiar with the traditional recommender systems, uh, Netflix, uh, YouTube, Spotify, all work in similar ways based on uh, the user's interactions uh, with the different items, uh, the system presents uh, a set of recommendations. And typically, these recommendations are organized according to different shelves. And these shelves have uh, labels. And those labels might be seen as uh, explanations for the recommendations. And the user can interact with these uh, recommendations, give uh, ratings or thumbs up, thumbs down. And based on that feedback, the next time they visit the site or when they refresh the page, they are presented with a new set of uh, recommendations. Now, I want to contrast this with a conversation recommender system, which would uh, work uh, as follows. 
uh, we can assume a chat-based interface where this uh, conversational agent would ask the user, what sort of movies are you interested in? I like thrillers a lot. Thrillers, for example, Zodiac is one of my favorite movies. Okay, uh, what do you like about that movie? And then the user might uh, start sharing, saying, well, I just think serial killers are general, in general are interesting, so the movie was really good, and um, it went really in-depth, and it was a long movie, but still uh, it made him feel that he was part of the world, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so based on that, the system might say, oh, have you heard about Deadpool? It's a movie about... Uh, Ex special forces guy, and it's a comics book movie with some inventive uh, storytelling. And then the user might say, Yeah, I, I don't really like comic book movies that much, but that recommendation sounds uh, interesting, uh, so I might be willing to, to watch that. All right, so more formally, a uh, conversation recommender system is a software system that supports its users in achieving recommendation-related goals through a multi-turn dialogue. And there are some fundamental characteristics that differentiate it from other types of systems. Uh, one is this multi-turn conversational interaction. It's a, a specific task-oriented dialogue system. Part of the task is to understand the user's preferences and uh, personalize the recommendations as well as uh, provide an explanation for the recommendations in natural language, not just a, a, a simple uh, label on a shelf. There are some challenges in this space, and uh, I categorize them in, in two main categories. One comes from the natural language nature of the interactions. How can we understand user preferences? How can we provide explanations? And the other one has to do with evaluation. So far, we still have a limited understanding of what uh, makes it a good dialogue experience, what makes it uh, enjoyable. And there's a shortage of uh, appropriate evaluation mechanisms. So I will talk about uh, these things. Um, it's also interesting, this topic, because uh, it's an intersection of different research areas. And this is an extremely complex and multifaceted problem. And these uh, different research areas focus on different uh, aspects. And there are many similarities and uh, differences which make it a unique problem. And in this talk, I will indeed uh, combine techniques from information retrieval, from recommender systems, and from dialogue systems. And I didn't uh, mention natural language processing and machine learning, because that's uh, everywhere that's present in all these three fields. OK, so more specifically, uh, I will talk about three aspects of uh, what uh, it means to, uh, to be more natural for a conversational recommender system. Uh, the first one will be about explaining preferences and recommendations. The second one will be about interpreting uh, feedback or critiques in natural language. And the third topic will uh, have to do with evaluation. Uh, throughout the talk, I will be using movies as a use case because uh, most people like movies. It's very easy to relate to, but I want to emphasize that uh, the techniques are not specific to movies. They should be applicable to any domain. Um, some of this uh, um, talk might be technical, and I know that it is a Friday afternoon, so you might decide to leave uh, somewhere uh, halfway and uh, then I don't want uh, anyone to go empty-handed so I just want to give the main take-home message early on it's uh, critical to have appropriate evaluation methodology and resources to make progress in this area so that's uh, uh, that's the the summary of this talk and um, I will be covering uh, three parts Based on recent work, I will stop after each part to see if there are any questions, and I'm very happy to take uh, questions along the way to make it a bit more interactive. This first part is based on work that uh, I did with colleagues at Google, and uh, it's about uh, explaining preferences and recommendations. 
I want to motivate it uh, with the same uh, classic recommendation scenario that I already mentioned in, in the opening. So we have this uh, setting where users uh, watch items, give ratings uh, to those items, and then there is some recommendation model. These days it is often a neural model that uh, generates uh, a list of uh, recommendations. The difficulty or issue with this uh, approach is that if our preferences change, let's say uh, someone uh, is no longer engaged in a romantic relationship and no longer needs to pretend that they like romantic movies, then it's very difficult to tell the system not to recommend any romantic movies anymore. Because the only thing that the user could do is to go back uh, to the history and either remove or downrate all those movies that are influencing the recommendations that they don't want to see anymore. Instead, what we would prefer is if the user model was transparent and explainable. For example, it would be a set of uh, statements about preferences of the user. Uh, and then the user could scrutinize uh, this uh, summary. So tell the system that, no, I'm no longer interested in romantic comedies and the recommendations would immediately be affected. So this is the main research question that I'm asking in this part. How can we explain user preferences and recommendations? The approach uh, will consist of uh, three main steps. One is uh, how to model user preferences, then how to explain those using natural language, and then how to make recommendations uh, based on uh, this user model. One of the simplest things uh, that uh, we can do is to model a user's preferences as a weighted set of tags. So think of movie tags that would be thrillers and uh, uh, romantic comedy and so on. The problem with that is that it alone is not that expressive to capture realistic user interests. If you remember the example that I showed about uh, the user who didn't like uh, comic uh, movies in general, but there were some exceptions. So we can capture this by considering how two sets of items might interact. And in this example, we can see that uh, uh, there's a user who doesn't like science fiction movies in general, but likes movies about space exploration. And that is a set interaction that can be turned into a natural language summary. And we can think of uh, several of those pairwise set interactions. You like one movie, one, one set, uh, one tag, especially if the second, or you don't like it, especially if the second, and so on. So we can generate uh, a model and uh, such model is shown in the, in the table on this slide. So we have either tags or pairwise tags and some weight. Uh, that's great. The only thing here is that this model might be too large. So we need to subselect a part of these tags and show uh, that concise uh, summary to the user. And uh, we can, uh, uh, rank them based on utility, uh, which is uh, basically we greedily uh, score these tags based on how significant they are, how many items they cover, and how well, um, and, and what is their weight. And then we rank them and select the top K ones. Next, uh, we can turn these into textual statements these interactions are designed in a way that by simply instantiating a template, we can give a summary of that uh, uh, tag or pairwise tag interactions. And what we do is we additionally add an example to ground that statement. It's uh, much easier for users to understand what we mean by that if there is a specific example. In this work, we only use two grades of intensity. So you either like or don't like something, but uh, one can easily think of uh, having uh, several grades 
or intensity of likes and dislikes and uh, use a bit more varied language around that. Now, uh, we have this uh, user model and we have this uh, natural language summary of the user model. All that is left is to develop a recommendation model. And we design a very simple content-based approach that uh, compares the tags that are in the user model against the tags that are associated with the item. We call it a set-based model. It's really a very simple model. Uh, we can combine it with the item popularity, which is a way of uh, relying on uh, collaborative uh, information. Uh, the more people generally like the movie, uh, the, that can be incorporated as a prior. And then one nice property of this model is that any recommendation translates directly to a subset of the user model. We can subselect statements from the user model that contain uh, the tags. And that is an explanation why that item is recommended to the user. Okay, so we would like to evaluate that. And for that, we do a user study. Why do we need a user study and not just use an existing benchmark? Uh, primarily because uh, existing benchmarks are highly biased. Uh, they only contain ratings for items that users have seen. And if we have a model that recommends uh, items that users were never exposed to, According to the benchmark, they would be considered non-relevant suggestions, while in uh, uh, real life, they might be relevant. So we have this user study that consists of uh, uh, three steps. First, we ask users to rate uh, some movies on a three-point scale. And additionally, we also ask them to tell us what they liked and disliked about the movie. We don't really use that information. We just want to make sure that they actually spend some time on thinking about uh, whether they really liked or disliked uh, that item. Then, based on those uh, preferences, we generate a summary of uh, uh, the user's preferences, natural language summaries, and we ask them to give us feedback on that. Since we are doing this uh, with the uh, uh, over 100 users, we want to make sure that this feedback is actionable so we can automatically process that. And for that reason, uh, it's set up as follows. We give users a complete statement and then remove parts of that segment uh, progressively. And we ask them to select the best one from top to bottom that applies to them. And then we can update uh, the user model accordingly. And then in the last step, we generate a, a set of recommendations using both baseline methods and our set-based model, and we want to compare the results. Okay, so first uh, we look at uh, some of uh, the baseline methods. And one thing to notice here is that the simplest possible baseline, just recommending items based on popularity, performs best and it performs best on this user study uh, in this more realistic setting than more advanced methods that were, perform, that were reported to perform better according to benchmarks. Then we compare it to two versions of the set-based model. One that we call fully transparent model is where the recommendations are based only on five statements and only on the tags that are in those five statements. Or we can uh, also use the whole user model, but only show the summary of the top uh, uh, preferences. And that, that's what we call partial transparency. And uh, we see that it performs uh, better uh, than the baselines. And uh, using uh, this uh, item popularity prior helps. And that holds for other evaluation measures as well. So the main takeaway message here is that it is actually possible to make a recommender system explainable and transparent, and one doesn't have to sacrifice effectiveness for that. 
Uh, there are several avenues for future work. Uh, these explanations are template-based and they can be made more human-like by using a, a model for generating the explanations. Uh, this model can be generalized to uh, explain not only item preferences, but uh, arbitrary interests in a personal knowledge graph. And there are better ways to utilize uh, feedback that users give on these summaries. So this is the end of the first part. I can stop here for a few seconds to see if anyone has any questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Let me see. There was someone raising hand. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think we have Muhammad yeah. raising his hand. Thank you. There you go. Now you should be able to talk, Mohammed. Unmute. Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you can hear me. Yes. Thank you, Christian. Uh, so I worked with Christian uh, at MGNU, so I know him. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's about uh, intent detection, right? Intent detection from the user side. So you have a kind of uh, in, uh, a set of intent on the content side, and then there you have uh, uh, intent on uh, on user sites, and you just have to match these two, isn't it? I, I wouldn't use the word intent because that that uh, usually means something else. I mean, the intent is to get uh, recommendations for movies that I would be interested in watching. Uh, what we are operating with is preferences. So what kind of uh, uh, movies do it's you kind like? of a building a user profile? Yes. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. More questions. You can either write in the Q&A or you can raise your hand. It doesn't look like it, Christian. So I, I suggest we move on, and then we'll uh, also have a Q and A towards the end. All right, all right. Uh, then I move on to the second part, uh, which is about natural language critiques, and this is again uh, another uh, work uh, with with Google, and this is uh, to appear in July actually. So you get to hear about it before it's actually presented at the conference. Um, I'm still uh, within the same movie recommendation setting, a conversational system. And now we want to understand uh, critiques, so feedback on recommendations. And you can imagine that uh, a system recommends some movie and then the user gives a feedback about some aspect of the movie. And that is uh, what we call a soft attribute. So a soft attribute is a property that is not something that uh, is universally agreed upon, but where it's meaningful to compare two items and say one has more of an attribute than the other. So one movie is more violent uh, than the other, or one recipe is more complex than another. And uh, you might think at this point that this uh, resembles tags, and that is true, but there are two crucial differences. One is that uh, tags are binary labels, whether the item has that property or not, and they don't allow for this partial ordering. And the other one is uh, that most platforms where users provide tags bias users towards using a consistent vocabulary by presenting suggestions and just uh, even just by showing what uh, other users attached uh, as tags to that item. And that is very important because um, it has implications uh, for uh, evaluation. And I will come back to that. So the question is, how can we interpret and measure these nuanced natural language critics that I will call soft attributes? And I will focus on two things here, uh, how to develop a test collection for this task 
and how to develop uh, what would be effective methods for the task of soft attribute based critiquing. And the task is uh, ranking items relative to a given anchor item with respect to a given soft attribute. So let's say the system recommended a movie inception and I want something that has a less of a, a plot twist, then I want to be able to rank other movies with respect to that uh, soft attribute. Uh, so generally for this task, the process of creating the, the test collection would go as follows. We need to sample some soft attributes, then we need to get some ground truth item orderings, and we need an evaluation measure that tells us how well an item ranking agrees with the ground truth. And uh, I will present two collections. One is based on uh, tags in a, a tag, in, in a, in a, it's called the movie lens uh, uh, movie collection that is publicly available. And the other one is uh, one that we are developing, or we develop based on a conversational data set. Uh, both are based on uh, some popular movies in, in a collection. Let's start with the tag-based collection. Uh, you can see some examples of tags, which uh, may be regarded as soft attributes. And we can infer ground truth using a heuristic that we can say there is one set of items where this uh, that did not get this tag assigned by any user. And we have another set of uh, items where a significant portion of users who assigned any tag to the item assigned the given tag. So we have these two sets. And then we can measure uh, ranking by looking at pairs of items in the ranking and checking how well they agree with the ground truth. Are they ordered uh, uh, concordant or discordant with, with the ground truth ordering? Alternatively, uh, and uh, this is uh, the main contribution of this work, we can sample. Uh, we can build soft attributes based on uh, an actual conversational uh, data set. And you can see an example of uh, some exchanges between a user and an assistant in a, in a collection where they talk about movies. And uh, from this collection, we extract uh, soft attributes where the user said, I want uh, more of that or less of that or that movie is just too blank for me. So too intense, too, too violent, and so on. Uh, already at this point, we noticed that uh, about half of these were never used as uh, tags. So these are different, even on the surface level. Then we design a multi-step uh, crowdsourcing interface to collect uh, pairwise item orderings. And uh, uh, what we want is to, in a way, uh, force users to think about how items compare according to a given soft attribute. But uh, we want to collect a large number of these preferences. So just showing two items, that would take a lot of work. Instead, we first ask users to tell us which movies from a pool they have seen. And then for each soft attribute, we give them an interface uh, that is uh, uh, depicted on this slide. So there is a set containing usually 10 movies and there's an anchor item. And uh, there is a soft attribute, let's say that's uh, violent and they have to drag and drop uh, these items into three categories based on whether they are less violent, about as violent or more violent than the anchor item. And uh, uh, the number of uh, preferences we can collect this way depends on uh, also on how we feed this interface, how we select the items. And I don't want to go into the details there. Uh, I just want to, to uh, show that the top illustration where there is a, uh, on the left, all items are in the leftmost bucket and on the right items are more 
um, uniformly distributed across these buckets. And that's what's desirable because then we can infer more pairwise uh, comparisons or preferences. So there is a certain methodology that uh, uh, helps us to achieve that. Now, uh, since we have uh, these uh, three buckets, we can have a stronger metric. And uh, it's an extension of the previous evaluation metric, but uh, it uh, differentiates between more and less and much more, much less. So the first part is the, the original version of the metric, where we just look at the number of uh, concordant and discordant pairs in adjacent buckets. And the second part, which we assign double weight to, looks at uh, the leftmost and rightmost uh, buckets. And if those are swapped, that's, uh, that's a bigger uh, mistake. OK, so then the question is, how can we apply these critics in a recommendation setting? And the core idea is that uh, if we can generate a ranking of items, according to a soft attribute, then it's enough to find the reference item that is marked uh, with orange in that ranking. And then we know which direction we need to move to if the user wants more or less of A, which is a soft attribute. So uh, our objective is to devise a scoring function that can be applied to any item and soft attribute pair. Um, I will just very quickly go uh, through it. The, the, the main idea is uh, to represent both uh, items and soft attributes in some uh, latent uh, embedding space. And we can learn representations for soft attributes in this uh, embedding space in three different ways, uh, from uh, no supervision to uh, full supervision. Uh, the first one, uh, the unsupervised way, is to build on uh, term-based retrieval models from entity retrieval. We have a review corpus, and then based on that review corpus, we can rank items. And uh, we can uh, represent a soft attribute as a centroid of the item embeddings in, in a space. And then we can score items based on their distance to this uh, soft attribute in that space. We can take this uh, idea a bit uh, further because uh, the unsupervised model only uses uh, uh, the top ranked items. So only positive examples in a way. We can also use the bottom of the ranking and say that those are negative examples and then use these as uh, pseudo training examples. So assuming that the top ranked ones would be positive examples and the bottom ones would be negative examples, we can learn a regression model and then score items based on that. Or if we have this uh, preference data that is collected using this interface that I presented earlier, we can also develop a fully supervised model that would learn pairwise item orderings. So I want to uh, walk through the evaluation results. In this table, we have two columns. One is the movie lens, that's the tag-based collection uh, with the original uh, correlation metric. And the other one is a soft attributes collection with the extended version of this correlation metric. In both cases, uh, one would mean perfect uh, uh, correlation and minus one uh, would be the opposite. So higher is better, and uh, uh, one would be a perfect score. And what we find is that uh, using this uh, um, term-based uh, unsupervised model, we get very good results on the tag-based collections, and we get much worse results on uh, uh, the new collection. Then we uh, have another unsupervised method and performance drops in both cases, so that's okay. Then we have this weekly supervised method, which uh, we would expect that would work uh, better since uh, there is uh, 
there's more uh, signals and it's a more advanced model. But what we find is that for the tag-based tag collection, it performs much worse, whereas for the new collection, it behaves as expected. And if we have a fully supervised model, which is only possible on the new collection because it requires these uh, pairwise preferences, then we would get even further improvement. So the key takeaway here is that uh, uh, using a wrong collection for a task would give completely misleading results. And uh, uh, we need to look at a more accurate abstraction of this uh, attribute ranking problem, which is, first of all, a much harder problem, as we can see from the absolute numbers. Uh, but then this new collection enables us to make progress. There's one more interesting aspect that I would like to highlight, and that is that uh, these soft attributes are inherently subjective. Uh, so people uh, disagree on what uh, is a boring movie or what is a um, what is juvenile humor. Well, maybe that's not uh, uh, that uh, subjective. So uh, in this table, we divided performance into three buckets, which were the highest, uh, the mid and lowest performing attributes. And what we find is that uh, the models perform best where there is a high inter-user agreement. So there is less subjectivity and performance is much lower where there is subjectivity. What it means is that uh, for some of the attributes where there is high agreement, uh, that's the leftmost bucket. We don't need to do any personalization and, and that's fine. For the soft, softer attributes, there is significant headroom for improvement and the models I presented, they were not personalized. So uh, we can see that uh, uh, those numbers are quite low. Um, so I will stop here again to see if there are any questions and not uh, repeat what I just said. It's on this summary slide uh, before, before moving on to the last part. Uh, Christian, we have, we have uh, a question in the chat. It's from, from Bernd uh, Bremdahl. And it's, uh, it's kind of, I think, as he writes here, it kind of touches on, on the first two parts. So maybe it's uh, appropriate to do that, do that now. Um, I'll try to read it. It's long. Uh, but he's asking, regarding the first part of the presentation, I acknowledge the fact that there are, could be radical changes in preferences for movies, as you described. But the more common case would be a more gradual migration from one focus to another. In all learning systems, there are always the tension between exploration and the exploitation to determine a change in base recommendations with a decay factor associated with the learning. So here are my two questions. One, could this not be used as a contextual basis for the NLP to hone in, I think it is, on the intentions of the user to reduce the number of interactions? Well, do that first and then the second afterwards. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question uh, uh, correctly, but, but I can uh, say something to the intro of the question. And uh, maybe it's, uh, it's uh, not a radical change, uh, but uh, users have, uh, you know, uh, in a traditional setting, the system infers some preferences based on how I interacted uh, with, uh, with, uh, with items. And it might just infer the wrong preference. And this is a direct way to correct that. So. Uh, it might infer that uh, uh, I like that movie because of uh, this or that, uh, but that movie might just be an exception. I actually don't like uh, uh, comic movies. I like this movie because of X. Or I don't want any recommendations that uh, uh, have a certain actor, for example, because I just uh, cannot stand that uh, person. And there is, so there is need to um, correct the system's understanding, uh, irrespective of uh, how 
uh, gradually uh, my preferences change or not. Uh, Bernd, I, I opened, if you want to discuss, you can uh, also unmute and take part. All right, um, thank you. Um, I acknowledge the fact that there could be some uh, you know, radical change over a short time that needs that type of correction. Now, but I just wanted to, to sort of address the fact that there, there could be a gradual gravitation towards something else that the NLP could actually use as a background uh, piece of background information in order to to determine and reduce the number of interactions with the user that so you contextualize it a lot better. Yeah, I I, I, I agree. All right, that was the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. How about the second part of your question, Bernd? You can ask it yourself. Well, well, uh, um, yeah. I think you touch upon this in the second part, which I, you know, actually I, I find this very interesting. But, but um, you said that um, some of the uh, some of the problems with um, sorry, there's my phone. Uh, uh, some of the problems that you have with with areas or offers that are not explored by uh, a, a user where you don't have uh, enough history. Uh, to actually make any judgment or recommendations. Uh, you know, in, in learning system, there's always this tension between exploration and exploitation. And couldn't just sort of uh, build uh, some impetus for, for, uh, for a user to actually explore more than he does and then use the NLP uh, part as you described in order to sort of spur that actions. And based on that, you could, consider this as a learning system where uh, you, you cover a lot more of the state space and action space, actions being preferences, state being the different uh, offers. And consequently, you could interpolate that uh, and, and use a regressor in order to determine what would be the axis of potential uh, interest and, and, uh, and so forth. And I, I think you touched upon this uh, basically, uh, or a, a little bit in your second part, but. This this was actually my original question. Uh, that, that, that's that's a very good point, and and uh, there is certainly room for that uh, exploration and exploitation uh, um, approach or, or paradigm here. Uh, I think my point is more like so th that that's somewhat orthogonal. So uh, we can use that to to determine what uh, items we we might want to give the users as, as suggestions. But uh, what we get back in this uh, conversational setting is much more than just a uh, like or dislike. The user actually discloses preferences in natural language and they don't just say, well, I, I didn't like uh, that movie, but they say, I didn't like it because X, Y, and Z. And that's where NLP comes in because you want to be able to use that rich feedback to, to better model the preferences. And it's, it's a very interesting idea for future work to see how that could be combined so that uh, the items are selected in a way that we learn the most about the user's preferences. Yeah, okay, that makes sense to me too. Uh, well, thank you for your answer. Uh, it's very interesting. Thanks, Bernd, and thanks, uh, Christian, for the answers. I said this we do the to the third part as well, and then we'll come back to questions. All right, I will try to rush through the third part. Uh, I'm switching gears now, so it's a different topic. It's uh, still conversational systems, but it's about evaluation. And uh, uh, this tree that you see here represents all the possible ways that a conversation between a system S and the user U can go. And uh, there are basically two principal ways of evaluation currently. One is to look at uh, a given turn, and this can be performed offline, where uh, for given user utterance, we have a set of possible system responses, and we know which response would be best. The other way would be to look at uh, uh, the whole course of uh, interactions uh, that's a given uh, a dialogue 
which we can annotate, but uh, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's just one branch in this whole space. So the question I'm asking is, can we simulate users for the purpose of uh, evaluation? And what we want to do in this work is to develop a user simulator that would produce responses that a real user would give in a certain dialogue situation. And uh, there is a formal objective. And the point here is that we want to be able to simulate a given user population with respect to a given evaluation metric. And we say that uh, this is realistic simulation or successful if the relative ordering of two systems agrees uh, for the user simulator with the actual population that we want to simulate. So uh, this work is about a simulation framework and some of its components. And there is, uh, there is some work on better user modeling and better dialogue flow modeling in this, uh, within this framework. Uh, what we use here is a, a standard task-oriented dialogue system architecture where there is a conversational agent and the simulator has uh, uh, the same components that a task-based dialogue system. So natural language understanding, response generation, and natural language generation. We build on uh, a well-established framework from dialogue systems where basically there is a plan that the simulated user wants to execute. We call it the agenda. And then this agenda changes based on how the system responds. If the system responds uh, to the user utterance in the expected way, then that's an accomplished goal. Then we move on to the next operation in the agenda. And if it's not accomplished, then we need to replan and uh, have some replacement actions. So there are two uh, main components to this approach. One is uh, an interaction model that defines how this agenda should be initialized and how it uh, is updated. Uh, we compare two models. One is a baseline model, which has only four states, the user can query or request and the agent can feedback or accept. Alternatively, we develop uh, um, action space that is uh, specific to this uh, conversational item recommendation scenario. And we have uh, uh, a specific flow. Uh, certain transitions are allowed and certain transitions are not allowed according uh, uh, to this model. The other uh, main component is the preference model. So how do we model the preferences of users? Uh, in both cases, we ground it in actual data. What it means is that uh, uh, we use this movie lens collection, which contains uh, items and user ratings on items. And we use one part of it as a preference profile and the other part as a test data. So imagine that uh, for, uh, we sample some users and then the activities of that user at to some point in time, until some point in time are used uh, as preferences and the rest are using, used for testing. In the baseline case, we only consider if the user has seen uh, or not uh, that item. And for the preference, we just flip a coin. And of course that uh, will offer limited consistency because the uh, user might uh, uh, like or dislike combination of items which are not very realistic. Uh, a more advanced approach is to uh, assume that we have item ratings available and then we model the preferences in a personal knowledge graph where we have two types of nodes, uh, items and attributes. And uh, whenever a new preference is disclosed that's added to this personal knowledge graph and that way we make sure that whatever the user says is consistent with the, the preferences that are already captured there. For uh, evaluation we compare 
three existing movie recommender systems, A, B, and C, using both real users and simulated users. Uh, for the real users, we set up a crowdsourcing task where they are asked to interact uh, with an agent until they get a recommendation for a movie that they like. And uh, uh, for the simulated users, we uh, train some of the parameters of the model based on the behavior of uh, real users. So we ask a, a number of questions here. One is, uh, how well do the relative ordering of systems correlate when using real users versus simulated users? In this table, the first row corresponds to real users and the following three rows uh, correspond to different configurations of the simulator going from the simplest to the more most advanced one. Um, we basically find that in all but one case, the, uh, the simulated users uh, agree with the real users. Um, in actually the best performing model, uh, which is highlighted, flips the ordering of systems A and B according to success rate. And that's because it uh, tends to terminate uh, earlier than actual users do. Uh, but this is not that big, uh, not an unreasonable error, because uh, th those two systems are very close in terms of uh, success rate. Uh, so the absolute values are quite close. Uh, overall, we see that there is a very high correlation between automatic and human evaluations. Uh, to understand how realistic these simulations are, we design an experiment which may be seen as a reverse Turing test. It's set up as follows. Uh, users get the transcripts of two conversations in random order. And one conversation is made by a real human and the other conversation is, based, is, is made by a simulated user, and they have to guess which one was the simulated user. Uh, in a way, in this experiment, we are trying to fool the human evaluators. So the more often we can do that, the better, the more realistic the simulator is. So again, we have uh, the three systems as columns, as well as the aggregated results, and we have uh, the three versions of the simulator. And we find that uh, the best simulator uh, could fool users or human evaluators in 36% of the cases. It lost in 41% of the cases. And in 23% of the cases, it was just not possible for the human evaluator to tell. So uh, we attribute these improvements to personal knowledge graphs and to better preference modeling, both of which uh, are shown to improve. Uh, so that is uh, the summary of this part. Uh, I presented this general framework and talked a little bit about this interaction and preference models. Um, this is not the end of this work. We have some ongoing work where we are trying to make simulators more human-like. And I just want to spend uh, my last minute uh, on that. And one of the traits of being more human-like is not giving up immediately if the system doesn't understand us. So uh, imagine uh, an exchange where the user would want to know more about restaurants in Dubai, and the system completely misunderstands it. Now, this is the part where the existing simulator would break down and it would be a complete uh, agenda update. So it would try something different, not ask about restaurants or restart the conversation. Instead, what a human might do is uh, to ask, well, slightly differently, can you find me a restaurant in Dubai? And then the system still doesn't understand. Can you rephrase? And then a human would just say, places for dinner. And this is a real human behavior that we observed by 
conducting a user study and studying how users uh, reformulate utterances. And one common pattern we observed is that first they would try to repeat, like uh, the agent didn't understand it in the first place, and then try to slightly rephrase it, and then they try to drastically simplify. And uh, we can uh, simulate this behavior using uh, uh, transformer-based uh, language modeling techniques. And there is a, a lot more uh, uh, directions that one can think of to make simulation more realistic, uh, considering the persona, how preferences change over time, uh, considering not just text, but also speech, uh, multimodality, images, clicking, uh, considering how users learn and forget, and how users learn what limitations of uh, the system are and how they can work around that. Uh, we have a workshop at SIGIR that I just want to quickly plug in here. If you are interested in simulation, then that's uh, going to be a great event. And uh, my slides are now telling me that I need to stop. So I will just uh, stop with this summary slide and uh, leave it up there and take some questions if there are any. Very good. Thanks a lot for a great speech, uh, Christian. Let's see if there are any questions. We have uh, one here uh, from Susanna uh, saying, how was the user study conducted? Were the users more eager to rewrite the sentences because it was, because it was part of a study? Yes, uh, users were uh, instructed specifically to be persistent and not give up. and. Uh, and try to uh, make as many attempts as, as, as they can. So this in a way is uh, the super persistent user. And when we want to plug this behavior into the simulator, then user persistence would be a parameter that we can adjust. And less persistent users uh, would be willing to maybe try once and, and others uh, can try several times. Yeah, it makes sense. We also have uh, Adam uh, raising his hand. Uh, I'll open your, you can unmute now, Adam, and ask your question. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, my question is uh, from an information security perspective. Is that, um, do you think that, um, these conversational recommender systems are more vulnerable or have different vulnerabilities than more traditional systems? And that uh, if they are more transparent, then is it something that uh, intelligent adversaries can exploit? For example, if I have a movie and I'd like to get it uh, recommended to everyone, uh, I might come up with some uh, specific uh, tricks. Uh, yeah, that's that. That's a great question, and and uh, uh, I don't have a very good answer to that. Uh, we have done some work on on, uh, or there, there's some work in the literature on you know explanations and what purpose they might serve, but uh, um, if someone is trying to make a very persuasive explanation, just to make as many users watch uh, a movie as possible and even tailor this uh, um, explanation so that it uh, appeals to the user and relates to their personal preferences, it's, uh, it's possible. But I don't think uh, it's any more, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's similar to Netflix uh, trying to recommend the same movie to you and, and putting something uh, uh, on the top of your recommendations every time. Uh, it's it, recommender systems can do that. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, I think we, we are at the top of the hour actually. Um, and I have no more questions from the Q&A or chat. So I think it's, 
uh, it's time to wrap it up. Thanks again, uh, Christian, for a very, very interesting talk. Um, thank you. And um, wish, uh, well, thank you for coming here and thanking you know, everyone in the audience also for, uh, for showing up for this uh, late night, or not late night, late afternoon uh, presentation. So thanks everyone and have a nice weekend. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.